We'll do a we'll do a Q and A. We will if you want. We can keep it short if nobody's interested, and then you can exit hopefully through the gift shop. And I will sign and chat to people. The only thing I would say is there's another act on, so we've got to be wrapped up fairly tightly. So yeah, if anybody wants to ask anything, now's your time. Margaret Murray, I was, I was glad yeah. that you mentioned it because yeah. I remember going to a talk that somebody else gave years ago. And I was thinking, when's he going to talk about Margaret Murray? Mm -hmm. Exactly how much do you think she had, uh, how much influence do you, do you think she had in modern, modern America? Massive. Margaret Murray, for those of you who don't know, was an Egyptologist, suffragette. A real groundbreaker. She does all, you know, she is the first woman archaeologist, basically. She is set up like an Aunt Sally to be knocked down in modern academia. So, yes, what she says about witchcraft is wrong. She bends the sources, she massages them, she does all kinds of weird stuff to make a polemical point. But to have it in a nutshell, it's not very good history, it's beautiful literature. So her evocation of the power of the, well, actually not the power of the goddess, ironically. She's into the horned god and the sacrificial king. It's Gerald the man, actually, who puts the moon goddess in the picture. That's one of the great ironies, that the feminist writer doesn't do it, but the feminist man does. But her idea of the, the sacrificial king, if you think about the wonderful novel, like most of the stuff Mary Sutcliffe was writing for kids in the 1970s that I grew up with, Knight's Fee and stuff like that, uh, Mark of the Horse Lords, it's all about the sacrificial king. William Rufus dies in the New Forest as the compact between the king and the soil his blood in one of her most beautiful gripping passages as it drips through the bottom of the cart is re-fertilizing the land, it's the fertility cult. So it's incredibly, incredibly potent stuff. So she takes, for instance, to give you an idea of its impact on Wicca, um, she takes one trial, which is utterly off the wall and unrepresentative, that of Isabel Gowdy, who's a Scots witch from Old Dern, who's hauled up in 1662. And what Gowdy talks about is a coven. We got a coven of 12, there's a maiden, and the devil comes and does the thing, right? It's nowhere else, but she seizes on it, and that gives you her idea of a coven structure. That's what you have. You have the maiden, you have the, the and again, it's interesting, see, Gerald devalues the man. And he, the other thing I should say, his other major contribution is he takes the devil out of it. It's not Satan, which is something entirely new. Even Jules Michelet, who's one of my favorite people ever, can't do that a century before. For Michelet's genius, he's still trying to reconcile Satan. You know, oh, it's the fallen angel. Um, so Murray is about as good as it gets. She knows Gerald. They're both members of the Folklore Society. She writes the foreword to Witchcraft Today, which is published just after the Witchcraft Act has been repealed and is the sort of founding, if you like, Wicca text. So yeah, she's utterly important and wrote some really gripping stuff. I mean, don't believe it, um, but whereas a literature festival so as literature, it's blinking amazing. And her stuff actually from a professional background about Egyptian magic and Egyptian religious hymns is stunning. And that's really good because actually her academic speciality was Egypt. And she again, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Gerald's taking all this stuff from Asia. She's taking it from Africa and they're planting it on Europe, which I think is kind of an interesting cultural thing actually to play around. So yeah very important and maligned and I think unfairly maligned. You know, we all do stuff. There'll be somebody in here, I'm sure in a hundred years time, they'll be going on about my stuff and going, got that wrong. But you know, we're not as Gore Vidal bless him used to say, we're not scholar squirrels hoarding our nuts. They're there, you know, they're literally and metaphorically knowing Gore. Um, um, they're there to be planted and germinate. And that's what's important. And she germinated 
this, this wonderful thing. No Charmed, no Humphrey, um, no Richard Carpenter's Robin of Sherwood with Hearn and all the rest of it without Margaret Murray, which is pretty good, isn't it? Anyone else? Not really to you, but to the audience. Um, Jane Wondered if anybody remembered celebrating Hot Tune A and Scarlet at Angus's place with the fire on the beach and jacket potatoes before jacket potatoes were a thing. <laughs> anybody? If you do, do come and see me at the end of our chat because I'll be fascinated. Yeah, did anyone go to the disco and the dancing? Anyone in the audience? <laughs> Love to hear about it. Yes, but apparently they were quite riotous because one of the guys who helped clean up the morning after, um, w w I was interviewing him in Peel and he was saying there was always breakages and, all, you know, in the gent, somebody had always kicked the wash basin off the surface. And so obviously quite a lot happened there. Although the Manx Press, again, the Manx Times runs an article and says, actually, this was great. That all, there was, what was it? I'm trying to remember the name of the teen, it was t called Teenland. Uh, a little column in there in the 60s, early 60s. And it says what the reporter really liked was all the youngsters had a really good time and there was absolutely no bad language. <laughs> And, that's, and then, sorry, I'm on a roll now. One of the other amazing th things I really love in the wonderful archives of the Manx Museum, and I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second, there is this incredible photo because Gerald and William Worrell, who ran the cafe for him brilliantly with his wife and later the Sound Cafe, were great at putting on events. And there is this brilliant photo of the Women's Institute Christmas dinner at the Witch's <laughs> Mill. So you've got all these women with the big permed hair underneath nude pictures. Gerald has drawn of witches. And you can just see the old boy laughing in that particular puckish way. But what I would say about that, and just while I've got the opportunity and I'm, I'm plowing this little furrow with you, Gerald's museum didn't survive. There are dissected bits of it that thanks to Simon Costin and Fergus um, still exist at Boscastle. Okay, Gerald was always very clear that museums were something more, they were something special. He'd seen the barbarism of Nazi Germany and the book burnings and what that meant for people with different cultures. And he always talked about museums as Temple of the Muses and that's why they're so important. That's why what you've got is your National Museum, that's why, you know, the stuff culture van do they keep everything going, you know? The independent bookshops keep things going. It's that spark and that thing that makes life worth living. Right, another question, if there is anything more. Yes, lady there. I'm interested to hear the influences from the East, yeah. with mm -hmm. Gerald Garner's yeah. mission. But um, I'm just wondering, because nowadays, I, I, from my, like, just very green I just see kind of a lot of Celtic influences mm -hmm. and I wondered where that came from was it Gerald or is that a projection from someone else? It, it's, it's a projection because what happened was to a very that there are there's lots of good primary source around Scottish witch trials that's number one because the Scots unfortunately hunted witches because James VI and I was a you know, wrote demonology, persecuted hard in a way that England never did. And witches burned in Scotland and on the Isle of Man, which had a Scottish legal system, Scottish influence legal system, in England they hanged and on a lesser scale. So there's lots of primary material. Why are witches caught up with the Celtic fringe when witches are not persecuted in Ireland are not persecuted in the Isle of Man after 1617. What you find after 1617 is that the burning in Castletown and Jim Sharp, if you want to read it, the best things, one of the best things on Manx witchcraft is a little article by James Sharp at the University of York and it's stunning. Um, but what he says is that the, the island was so traumatized and polarized by the burning 
that Manx juries would not convict witches. And when you look at the statutes, they're very good at defraying the tension and bringing, in fact, some callows, it has to be said, were very good when, when uh, Mary and Jodie Callow get run in during uh, Bishop Wilson's reign. And I don't think Wilson was a good thing for the Isle because he was a witch hunter, okay? Yeah? Don't, don't love your oppressors, you know, him and Barrow. <laughs> Um, you know, what they did to the people on the Isle was barbarism and brutality. But what the Callows and others do, actually, is that they take out defamation suits. So a neighbour says, we saw your women folk in the sheep pen uh, with their hair down around their ears, taking soil away, doing a ritual. And what the people do if they're fast enough on their feet is they have them for defamation. So Manx juries, and you can see it in Bishop Wilson, he is furious, he cannot get a Manx jury to convict. Chaloner, the governor up until the restoration, is the same, he imports witch hunting. Manx juries will not convict. So the witch is absent, right, in the Celtic societies. The difference is, remember the Bucklands, they go to America? The Americans love Celtic stuff because you've got big Irish communities and they what they want is traditional witchcraft. Problem with traditional witchcraft is it doesn't bloody exist. There is no unbroken lineage. There just isn't. It's rubbish, okay? Doesn't exist. Ronald Hutton's proved it a million times going, okay? These things are fiction. So what happens, to give you a very blunt assessment of what happens, is that people in the States go looking for it. So they go to the Irish community, but the Irish community are all Roman Catholics and involved in things like, you know, the church or trade union parades and really boring stuff like that. And they know them and they're not where that's it. So they look for another Celtic group. So they alight on the Scots, but then there are lots of Scots in Canada. So they meet them and no, my, you know, Auntie Aggie really didn't dance around in the nip in a circle. She was a good Presbyterian woman and all the rest of it. So then they go to the Welsh. So there is this big thing in the 1970s, every witch is Welsh in America. If you think of the Fleetwood Mac, the Stevie Nicks thing, Rhiannon, those of you have heard it, she always introduces it on stages. This is a song about a Welsh witch because Welsh traditional witchcraft suddenly got really popular. Because the chances are, if you're, a, if you're a revived pagan in Arkansas, you will probably not meet a girl from the valleys who could tell you that the valleys are not full of wood smoke and you know bonfires and broomstick riding and all this. So guess what's happening now? Have a guess, audience participation. What is the latest traditional witchcraft North America has found? Manx witchcraft. <laughs> um, again, so, you know, that's the latest thing, because God so help me, I did, I did a couple of lectures at the Manx Museum, and people, as they will sometimes and charitably do, is sat there in the audience and wrote the thing down, and then published in a little pagan paper, and said, oh, there's Manx traditional witchcraft. But it's not Gerald, and it's not any of the people he ever knew. It's a secret line. So secret, nobody's ever heard of it, kids, yeah? And again, it defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Because there's nothing wrong. This is my point in all of this. There is nothing wrong to be the first one to do it. You adopt a feminized nature religion that works for you, that says, let's be a bit nicer. Let's not, you know, Let's celebrate the female form and her potentialities. Let's care about the environment. That's as good a religious system as any I can think of. 